Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be back with my dear friend, Melissa Romero, the spiritual misfit. She is a woman's empowerment coach who guides women on personal freedom journey. First of all, thank you for coming and welcome, welcome. We are, we are actually being heard on my podcast and on my YouTube. So we, are, we have a listeners and we have a viewers. So keep that in mind when we're talking, because I want my listeners to also get everything. Um, I want to ask you first, what is spiritual misfit? Uh, <laughs> so that, that name came up. It was pretty funny. Um, I, well, my whole tell, life. Tell us the whole story. We have time. Yeah. <laughs> my whole life. I, um, I never fit into a box. So I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, in this super open world where we were able to be who we wanted to be. And I never, I never experienced racism and things like that when I was little. And then I moved, my mom had moved us through just process of life. We ended up in South Jersey. Um, and here in, in South Jersey, all of a sudden, like people fit into a box. So let's say if you were Latina or Puerto Rican, you were supposed to dress and look and listen to specific type of music. And if you were white, you did the same thing. You had your kind of music. And if you're black, you had your kind of music. And it was like this crazy world that I didn't fit into because I was this Latina girl that came in. I dressed like a skater. I which was a white thing. You didn't do that when you were Latina. I <laughs> loved hip hop music. I loved alternative music. I love old like 70s rock, like The Doors and Pink, and Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. Like I listened to all these things. So I always felt as though I was a misfit. Like I never fit in into what I was supposed to, a little box that I was supposed to fit in. And that was my whole entire life. And then it became something that was exciting to me. Then it was like the less I fit in, the happier I was. So oh God, I thought the misfit meant, meant like misbehave. I didn't even think no. of it as misfit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you created this word. Great. Yes. Now it no, oh, okay. I'm a little slow. <laughs> no, 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 but that's cool. And and I guess that's that's the beauty of it, because it may it it feels like uh like, like it doesn't go together, the spiritual misfit, like the spiritual that that's, that's the play on words. That's what I love about that name. The spiritual misfit is yeah. because to me, it means that I just don't fit. I didn't fit the, the vision that people had for spiritual people when I first started mm -hmm. um, on a spiritual path. Like I, I had tattoos. I said the word fuck every now and then, you know, I, I just didn't fit into, I didn't wear Buddha pants. I didn't wear like, you know, mala beads and things like that. And, but I was still spiritual and I wore a leather jacket and I, you know, and so, and I wore red lipstick and these were like things that were just like, oh, that doesn't fit into the prototype of, you know, what a spiritual person is supposed to look like. I am yeah. so with you because I have a book called Modern Medicine Woman and I'm on the bikinis my cover yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, people were, and people were kind of judging me slightly oh we love what you're doing but don't you think you know you should put a picture while you're meditating or something I'm like why yes why? I do the jungle I do the work I come here I drive a car I get many pities I have fake lashes I love it exactly we don't we can be anything we want why put labels on Exactly. I have a friend. Um, she's in our in our medicine community. Uh -huh. And we were talking once and she was like, we were talking about different shoes and she we were just talking about Louboutins and like Louis. And I I don't I just personally don't have I have a pair of Louboutins, but I don't really wear that stuff or yeah. but I was telling her like you can totally be spiritual and wear Louboutins. You can totally be spiritual and have a Louis bag. You know, exactly. just, most spiritual people don't go that route. That doesn't mean you're not. Or, you know, or drive a Ferrari. Or drive a Ferrari. Yeah, like whatever makes your soul sing, just do that. Exactly. The more happy you are, your cup is full. It's overflowing, so you can give. Exactly. exactly. So, Melissa and I, we met in Colombia. Yes. We have the same teacher, Taito Juanito, who I love mm -hmm. so much. He literally changed my life. Um, also, he changed my life, but I did the work. 
Yes. Nobody well, has been about bigger. that all the time. He always talks about, don't forget that the work is yours to do. Yes. Like I did the work and I'm still doing the work. And I think we all are doing the work every day. Every day is a ceremony for me. Every day is gifted. And I really feel that super grateful that I get to play another day because I can go tomorrow. This could be my last interview. God knows, right? So Melissa and I, we met there and we connected and she's so beautiful. We're almost the same age. We're single mamas and we have the same mission. We want to empower women because we've been through it. And uh, now we're sharing our knowledge. We're not better than anybody. We're just a little ahead of the time. We started a little bit earlier. We, we had a chance to do these travels and meet with great people. And I want to know, people already know my story. I want to know why did you, why are you doing what you're doing? What happened? What was your trigger to get you to this path? Oof. I know, it's a loaded question. <laughs> it is. You don't have a time limit, so. We have hours, because. Yes, we do. <laughs> Because oh your, story, your story will empower a lot of women who feels they're stuck. I believe it. Or I who feels it. they're old. It's done. Yes, yes. Yes, I believe it. And I'm, and I'm totally there for it. Um, my, my story, uh, I've been my, I, I feel like the life has been priming me for this since day one. Uh, I, I, I was born to a teen mom. Um, she was 16 when she had my sister. By the time she had me, she could, she couldn't even have a drink legally, uh, but she already had three kids wow. and so an, and an alcoholic father. So, um, I was born in, in a pretty toxic household and, um, but you know, being a little girl in that household, you don't know it's toxic because to you it's the norm. Um, so I, I grew up, I had a pretty rough childhood. My mother went to prison when I was nine years old. Um, and we, my brother and I went from home to home until finally my grandmom took us in, who that's a whole other story. Then I had some issues with my grandma where she was a bit abusive. And uh, my mom was in prison for the whole process, it took about three years, three to four years it's a blur to me. And then uh, my mom came back home from prison and saw how I was being treated and decided enough is enough. I'm taking you out of this house. And then she ended up getting uh, a house and whatever. And, and, and so all that led up to who I was today, led up to, to, you know, all the battles, all the, per the person that I became, all that, that foundation created who it was that decided she needed to heal, right? The unworthiness, the, the eager to please, the I'm not good enough, which is unworthy. And that's, that's, the, that's the narrative that plays and presents itself over and over and over in my, in, in this incarnation for me. And so I know that, that that's something that I have to, that's something that I'm here to heal, not only for me, but for the, my ancestors, which I'll tell you a little bit about my last ceremony uh, where I healed this amazing wound that has been going on for generations and generations in my lineage. So with that said, that presented itself quite often uh, when I, and I'll fast forward because the story is long. Maybe I'll, I'll write a book someday. You guys can read the book. Um, I'll fast forward to... Uh, my teen years, I, I was partying, doing drugs, you know, and then uh, when I was about 19, 20, I was a full on coke addict and alcoholic. Um, and at that same time, I started dating my drug dealer and ended up pregnant. <laughs> With wow, my I had no idea. I'm so happy I'm doing this interview. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I ended up pregnant. I had um my oldest son, and that changed my life. Uh, before I had my oldest son, I didn't think I could have children because I had, and I was never, I was never um promiscuous. I was always very, very conservative when it came to sex. For some reason, I was very sexualized growing up. I lived in a very sexualized home and a very sexualized environment. So to me, sex was something that I wasn't very open with because I, I just, it was always, it was always around. It wasn't like it was something new, you yeah. know, men were sexualizing me when I was 12 years old, you know? So 
I was always, I was never promiscuous. I always did long relationships. Um, and so I had my, my second, my first boyfriend, my first boyfriend apparently gave me uh, an STD, which would have caused me at the, at my, at, that's by the time I was I got, before I got pregnant with my son, I was, I was getting all these cramps and these pains. And I didn't know, cause I had only slept with two guys. By this point I was on my second boyfriend and I was 19 years old and I was on my second boyfriend. But and, did you uh, notice that you were kind of repeating your mom's back, your mom's life? Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, yeah. girl, let me tell you about my mom repeating my mom's life. Cause that was that, that I did notice that in a little yeah. bit in life, a little bit later on. And I ended up, um, I was dating my second boyfriend and we were like kind of on the rocks. We were ending it. And I was getting these horrible cramps, like these painful cramps. And so I went to the doctor uh, and she had said I was in an accelerated version of this STD and that chances are I would never be able to have children. So at that point, here I am, 19 years old. This doctor just told me I can't have children. So I never thought that I would ever have children. So I went balls to the wall. You know, I, I always wanted to have children. That was always like a, a goal of mine, but I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I can't have children. Let me just go. And so I went, I partied. I was a huge party promoter in New York city. Uh, I worked at amazing clubs and that's how I got introduced to the world, the beautiful world of cocaine, because I wanted to stay up and party and socialize and yeah. cocaine just did that. It was so beautiful. Like the minute I, I snorted my first line, I was like, hey. And I was like the social butterfly. So there I went and then it just became a problem. Like I just, the drinking, the cocaine um, to the point where I lost jobs. I wouldn't show up um, to events that I was supposed to show up. And then I ended up dating my drug dealer. <laughs> and that's, and I ended up dating my drug dealer. I was actually going through this horrible heartbreak with this other boyfriend of mine. This is my third boyfriend at the time. And, uh, and I met my drug dealer and he, he promised me the world and he gave it to me. And so I settled for that in, in the way that a 20 year old would, like, I didn't know any better. I was like, ah, he's got a good house, a nice car. We could have a good life together, I guess. Like I could be taken care of. And that's all I cared about at the time was well, so if someone would take care of me. And, um, I never really loved him. Uh, but then I ended up pregnant with, with my son and like I said, it changed, completely changed my life. Like I, you probably I, didn't know what love is until you, you met your son. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. I, the minute I found out, I, the, it, it happened the minute I found out he was in my belly. Like I just realized. And then all of a sudden life was different life. I, I had to, I didn't love myself. So I had to live life loving somebody else. So it just, it made me just become this whole different person just for this being, for this life, which is also not a good place to be. But I didn't know that. And it was an upgrade from where I came. You so, needed that at that time. At that time. Exactly. That became your medicine. That exactly. Because That's exactly. you were so at rock bottom, you needed something so irrational. <laughs> yes. Yes. Giving birth was your only way. Exactly. To save your life. And he probably came to save your life so you were being looked after exactly by the spirits and I tell him that all the time I always tell him, he's 21 now <laughs> and so I tell him all the time I'm like all right puppy you saved my life and he knows he knows the whole story don't tell um, me don't 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 kiss me from the my friend <laughs> oh no at 21 he's actually he doesn't mind now he oh, went through a year old definitely she's like drop me off 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 <laughs> the school door I don't want anyone to see you <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. My, my 21 year old was like that. I don't want my 12 year old to ever get like that. He's, he's my biggest fan. He's like the best thing ever, but um, yeah, so that's, so that's what happened. And then I gave birth to this amazing baby boy. Um, and you know, it was, tri it, it was, it was like trial by fire with, with giving birth because, you know, I was in a loveless relationship, uh, but I wanted him to have a good family. I wanted him to have a house with and so my my his dad stopped dealing drugs he opened up a business um and we really tried to make it work and I tried to love him and then I realized that you can't you can't make yourself no. no it doesn't work that way and so that happened and so my oldest one came into my life and not only showed me how to love but he showed me how to really you know how with the medicine they say the medicine tests you before you go drink to make sure you really want it 
I felt like my son tested me. Like he was like my test. Like, like here it is, this thing that you get to love, but do you really love it? Cause he, he, the life with him was so difficult because my, um, my ex, he, when he realized I didn't want to be with him, he just did whatever he could to make my life as complicated as possible. And one of those things was turning my son against me. And so there was always this, I fought to love him, but he fought, he like pushed away from me. My son would be like, I don't want to go with you. I don't. And it would be like this tug of war, like, but I love you so much. And it was like, so it was, it was all such a beautiful lesson. And it all taught me exactly. I mean, if you see my son now, you would never even know that. And even he, he, um, one day he was, he told me, you know, you know, mom, dad used to say such horrible things about you. And I really believed them. And now I see you and I see him and it's different. I, 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 I really see the truth. And the thing is throughout this whole battle with my ex and with, you know, for my son, I always said, cause my mother, my mother, she was just like, you know, you should like make false accusations against him. And I'm like, no mom, at some, at some point in my, all I care about is my son. I don't care about what he thinks. And I was like, at some point, he's going to see the truth. And so yeah, I'm just, they, like, I'm, they, they always grow up. Exactly. I was like, I'm just going to be who I am. I'm going to love him the way I love him. And I'm going to tell him his father is good because his father is a good father. He really loves him. He yeah. just, he has his way about it, whatever. And so it happened. And eventually my son saw who it was and it was, it, it's a beautiful thing. I still work with him now with, you know, cause he has a hard time forgiving his father for all of this stuff. And so I'm working with him on that. Cause I really think like, he's still your father, yeah. you know, you don't have to keep him in your life, but you do have to forgive. Well, him. I'm here. If you, if I can help him with NLP processes, we can always work on that. Yes. Um, so I want to know about your mission. Now you've been through what you've been through and you have a lot of experiences under your belt because you lived it. Yes. And there's a lot of women out there. And I know you want to empower women so they don't go through what we've been through. Yes. So um, what is your soul growth technique that you talk about, you, you created, that you take people to this journey? How do you help them be empowered and in yeah. control? So the way I look at life is I, my, my, my whole course and most of the stuff that I've created is how to love yourself unapologetically, right? How to love yourself and not like you said, how, how do, how do I, how am I spiritual unapologetically? And I wear Louboutins and how do I get fake lashes and how do I do this? How do I love myself and not give a fuck about what people think? Right. And so that's, that's always my goal with women. Like, how do you put yourself first? To a point where you accept yourself so much that who gives a fuck what anybody else thinks? You're you. And that's it. And you're perfect just the way you are. And so that's always my mission with women. And I feel I've learned in the process of working with women that it's 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 a it's a whole, I have a whole process that I do. I use, I use these six pillars that I work with women. And I look at it, I got this, this process that I use based on have you ever heard you I, I'm sure you know of Michelangelo, the sculptor. Yes. So they, there's a story that says that there was a lady once that interviewed him. And this, every, when I heard this the first time, it blew me away. There's a lady that interviewed him and she, she asked him, she goes, Michelangelo, how do you create these masterpieces from these slabs of marble? Like, how, how, do, you, how do you possibly do this? And how do you see it in the marble? And my, Michelangelo goes, um, the masterpiece is already in the marble. I just chip away at all the excess marble. And so the program that I use with women and the, the program that I've created to use with women is that is just that we first work on getting rid of the excess marble. We first get rid of those limiting beliefs. We talk about the inner critic, right? We work on forgiveness. So I work on all these things that get to get rid of all that stuff that society has built up, all those things that we've created, all these belief systems that our parents, society, teachers, whatever it is, have created within us, right? And those belief systems, they fuel this inner critic that tells us we're not good enough on a consistent basis because you know why you're not good enough? Because remember when your teacher told you this? And that's the truth. That's a fact. And so we start learning that these beliefs that we have aren't facts, they're beliefs. And so by going deep, because the thing is, we convince ourselves that these beliefs are facts. 
It's it's the craziest thing, and I'm sure you know about this. If you, oh if you, oh my goodness, on my sessions, I always, I always get it. And so if someone says, for example, I know I cut you off, but I'm going to come back oh, to yeah. it. Um, if they say, oh, all men are taken, all good men are taken. Yeah. That's really common. I say, when did you make that decision? And then she goes like, well, what do you mean? I say, you just made a decision that all good men are taken. So she created a belief. Exactly. There's no good men out there for her. Yeah. Therefore, it's her reality. Yeah. So when you meet with these people, you're basically making unconscious conscious. Exactly. Exactly. By, by chipping away all those marbles. All of that. So there. What well, basically what we do is we unlearn. So exactly. we're working on unlearning all those things that we've like literally. I've I've had women that are like. Well, I have to earn my place in the world. Yep. Well, wow. Self -worth. Zero self-worth. Yes. And where, and so then we break that down. And when did you, re oh, well, actually today, one of my clients, she's one of, she's amazing. Uh, she was telling me, she was like, well, I don't know about that being a belief system because, you know, I always had good grades. My parents were always very proud of me. And then, and we, she started breaking it down she's like my little brother and sister didn't have good grades and they would yell at them about how they had to be like me and she's like but I don't understand where this 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 belief system about I have to earn my place in the world and I was like it's not so obvious but if you think about it when your parents rewarded you and didn't reward your brother and sister for their scholastic achievements there goes the lesson. You realize that, oh, I have to earn my parents' love. Therefore, I have to earn my place in the world. That's Therefore, I have to earn everything that I have. Because when I do well in school, when I get good grades, my parents do this whole huge, huge thing. And so it's the same with food. We do it all the time with food. Like, oh, m and My mom gave me M&Ms whenever I did something she liked. So now, anytime I'm depressed, I eat a bag of M&Ms because they make me happy because that's reward. And so it's all behavioral, but we have so many, so many of them. And the crazy thing is, and I know because I, I've, I've, pro I've done this process on myself is that, and I've catch myself sometimes thinking that because some, some of them, we really believe that they're facts. Like we literally are like, no, it's a belief system. Like it's, it's not a fact. And so, and then I have them break down. All right. So this is a belief. Now let's break down the facts there. Right. Where where are the facts in this belief? Because there are some facts or what is happening, even even on a day to day basis. We we come into situations and we assume, you know, this girl looked at me a certain way. She looked at me dirty. Oh, she doesn't like me. I know she doesn't like me because look at the way she looked at me. She doesn't like me. Yeah. Uh, what happens in our brain when you have a belief? Every experience you live after that belief created remotely reminds you the feeling that you had you say oh you see because that she looked at me bad i must have something wrong or oh because she said that i'm not good enough so yeah. you're just building and building and that ball of energy gets bigger and bigger and bigger and takes over your life exactly your brain is looking for similarities it's like when you decided you want to have a baby all of a sudden you see all the pregnant women Exactly. Or you want to buy a certain car, all of a sudden you start seeing all the car yeah. uh, on the road that you, it's your brain literally is bringing up what makes your brain happy. Exactly. Because your brain is here to serve you and keep you safe. It's a survival mechanism. Exactly. And it's gazillion million years old. Uh huh. Yeah. So every belief is limiting, even if it's a good belief. That's what I say. Yeah. When yeah. I work with my clients, we work on abundance. And I say, how much money do you want to make a month? 20,000. I said, why not 30? He's like, what? So if you believe you can make 20, you can do 30. What about we don't put a number and we say unlimited. And it's really hard for people to accept that. And yeah. why worthy of unlimited income? Yeah. It's like, these are like sh core shaking it is processes. So tell me what you do when you go to retreats, because I know you have, you have retreats, like how many times a year? Well, I just had my first international one, um, in June, no, July, July, July. Oh, you were in Bali? No, we did Mexico, Mexico. Wow. Uh huh. It was, oh my God. So what I do, what I do in my retreats, it depends on the retreat. If it's a weekend retreat, it's different. If it's, uh, mm -hmm if it's a week long retreat, what I do is I, I, I 
I put women through my process, my six part process, okay. uh, but it's a, it's a quick accelerated uh, six part process. And then if they want to dig deeper, they get to choose whether or not they want to work with me after. Oh I would love to do a retreat with you. It would be so good with the combination yeah. with NLP and your magic and us yeah. together. And we would have so much fun. Oh my God. <laughs> it's yes. all about having fun for me while we're doing what we're doing. We have Girl. to have fun. I, that's what I, I, when I, when I remember when I organized this retreat and everybody's like, Oh, Melissa, the spiritual misfit, it's going to be so spiritual. And I'm just like, people really think spirituality is so serious. And I'm just like, dude, spirituality for me is joy. It's fun. It's how at, in my retreat one day we were all on the beach. And one of the girls is like, we should all go swimming naked. Who took off their outfit first? Me. I was like, let's go. And everybody followed me. And all the women went into the ocean naked after me. And it was so much fun. We were all splashing in the water naked. It wasn't planned out. But I'm always down to like, whatever, let's do this. Let's have fun. Let's enjoy life. And I actually heard it from one of our medicine family members uh, at a ceremony. I don't, I'm sure you know Eli. Yes. Uh, I drank medicine with him my first time. I drank with him and uh, Luis Gabriel. And um, in one of the ceremonies, at the end of the ceremony, everybody, you know how sometimes at the end of the ceremony, it's like, so everybody's disheveled and it's like, oh, life is so hard. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I always and go so with my lashes and in the morning, my <laughs> on the cheek, it coming down on my lips. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so everybody looks so distressed and, <laughs> and Eli looks around and he starts laughing. And everybody's like, what the fuck is he laughing at? And he starts laughing with Gabriel starts laughing and everybody has this like look on their face. Like, why is he laughing? And then Eli comes out of nowhere and he goes, this is supposed to be fun. And everybody starts laughing. And I swear out of everything that happened in that ceremony, that's the one thing that always sticks with me. It's I, I and I use that for everything in my life. Like when I see myself like, oh, I got to pay bills. This is supposed to be fun, Melissa. Or I got to work out. This is supposed to be fun. Or if I'm like sad over a breakup or something that happened, this is supposed to be fun, Melissa. Like, can you see the fun in this? And then I get to like, yeah. Get it differently. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what's my uh, mod mojo or motto every day? I and have a little sticker on my mirror. Today is the best day ever. I love that. So you, for you, it's, this is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be for fun. Me, today is the best day ever. Yeah. And another one that I work with is what if nothing's wrong? Cause we sit I there, do. isn't that, and I, we sit there. That was another one of my teachers that said this to me uh, one time uh, and where I was like talking about how wrong everything is like, this is wrong and life is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And he goes, well, Melissa, what if nothing's wrong? And I was like, what? This is so is wrong. true. Every darkness we've been through got we got got us where we are today. Exactly. And if it didn't happen, we would not have the knowledge. We would not be hanging out with the people we're hanging out because if I didn't go to ceremony, I would not meet you. Exactly. So we created a community. We created a support system. We learned so much, and now we're sharing. I'm so happy for every burden I've been through. Exactly. I feel the same exactly. Even way. your ex, even my ex. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, yes. No, I agree. I agree. I And I always do that. Now, ever since, ever since that became one of my models, which was like about three years ago, the what if nothing's wrong, even when I'm going through something, like even when I'm going through a breakup or something that's sad, or I ask myself, like Melissa, and I remind myself that, you know, there's a light at the end of this tunnel, you know, okay. this too shall pass, you know, the, the beauty of impermanence, you know, these people, whether it's, it's a boyfriend or a friend, maybe sometimes we end f friendships, you know, nothing is forever. Like it's, 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 this is the beauty of it. My dog is trying to make the, no, that's all good for me. Besides my kids, nothing is forever. Nothing is forever. Nothing is forever. And it's, and, and there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in that because you get to see you get to see and enjoy what it is for what it is. And you also know? when you start seeing nothing is forever, you stop labeling relationships. You stop labeling experiences. Like if I want to date a younger man, I'm going to date a younger man. If I want to date an older man, I'm going to date an older man. You know what I mean? I don't yeah, have to yeah. like think about the big picture and the five-year plan. I'm really enjoying this right now. So I'm going to do it. Exactly. And you, also, 
Yeah. And you also get to live without ex expectation. And you also get to live in surrender when you when you accept that nothing is forever. So you know, you this, to... this is what you teach. Exactly, exactly. So when is your next um, retreat? Well, I have a weekend retreat coming up at the end of this month. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, they, we call it friends outside. It's with two of my friends, uh, and spirit brother and sister that are local here. And, uh, my one is my little sister. I call her my little sister. She's my little spirit sister. And we serve medicine here in the Philadelphia area. Uh, we do divine feminine ceremonies and we serve happy. And so, uh, she's, she's, it's going to be her. And then one of my friends, Jason, and it's going to be a co-ed retreat, which is my first co-ed retreat. So I'm excited. Uh, I've been feeling the call now, although I've been, and this is another thing we could talk about. Uh, I've been working with women for so long. I've been really feeling the call to work with men. Okay. For several reasons. Um, well, they need to heal their feminine too, you know? Yes. And another reason is because I learned actually in my last ceremony that for, in order for men to heal, we have to heal. And a lot of, I, I feel like we have to heal together. And I feel like there are so many men leading men to healing and they're not, it's like, and, and with no offense, it's like the lead, the blind leading the blind, yeah. because I feel like it really needs the, the, the male population or the masculine, the divine masculine really needs a feminine to come in and teach him how to heal. Because although men could be healers and men could be teachers, women, it's, it's literally a divine feminine aspect to be a healer. So we are healers. So I even asked the medicine last time I was in ceremony, why are there so many women in the world in comparison to men? Why is there, why is there such an abundance of women and so little men in the world, because it's true. If you think about women and I don't know the science behind it, but there's, there's, I don't even know how many women per men. And I asked the medicine and she goes to me because you are the creators, you get, you are the healers and the world needs this. And so it was such a beautiful thing. And it was such a beautiful aha moment that I, and, and, and for me, it scares the shit out of me, to be honest with you, to work with men. Like I told you, when I was very young, I was sexualized very early in life. And so men, to me, kind of scare me. I feel very unsafe. When oh, it, it comes will be a great medicine for you to go through this yes. on and heal yourself while you're helping them heal. Exactly. And this is how I looked it at like it. your fear. It, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You read the words. You read my mind. Exactly. And so I've been called to do it. I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know. I haven't, you know, and the medicine also told me I need to be more patient <laughs> and allow for for life and for God and the universe yeah. to to make things happen for me because I always want to you yeah it'll, it'll come it yeah will come to you um, yeah the good thing is if whatever you're creating if the time came there's no way you can stop it exactly so it's waiting for its time to be marinated and be delivered to your door exactly exactly yeah, when medicine told me that um I want to actually emphasize this. When we say when medicine told me, we're talking about when we drink ayahuasca and we, you know, go into a journey and you have a conversation with mother ayahuasca, which is the mother earth. So when we, when we say the medicine told me, we're talking yeah. about that. <laughs> uh, we both have had many, many ceremonies and um, we are at the point now, after drinking so many times, you come to a point, you're no longer healing, now you're learning. Your learning yes. starts after a certain um, time. And I've been with the medicine for over five years and I'm sure you too. And yeah. now when I drink, I drink for, okay, what am I doing? Show me the path. Exactly. What do I need to do? What, what am I here for? And so when she gave me my mission, I just didn't know what she meant at that time. Mm. And she said, fix your house and help people with integration. I'm like, uh, what do you mean fix my house and help what, what? And literally for the past, after that ceremony, coming eight months, I have been through hell and back. I've been through court for custody, ton of debt that I had to pay, 
I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I could be like homeless. Oh my God, what's going on? I literally had to rewire everything. I was a hermit. I just didn't talk to anyone. I just went to work, basically. Wow. Meaning I had to face everything head on. No more, oh, I'll take care of it later. Oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it here. And yeah, yeah, I'll deal, I'll deal, I'll deal with it Monday. Yes. So, I had to, I had to. And um, being in custody court was the biggest, painful, scariest, and the lowest vibration that you can ever be. I wish, I don't wish it to my enemy. And that taught me a lot. So when that happened, and with NLP coming into my life, literally now I'm celebrating and I'm so happy. I, I went through what I had to go through to get here and I couldn't be more happier. So with yeah. that being said, now I'm so honored to host people like you because we are the change makers. Yes. You know, and yeah. nobody grows out of comfort. No, God, no, no. I feel like my most uncomfortable situations are where I had my hugest, hugest, hugest growth. And actually right now it's a very uncomfortable situation because I literally left my comfort zone. I left my job. I had, I was a teacher for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a school teacher and I decided last year in June that I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. And I I'm right now self-employed I, I'm an entrepreneur and this is all I do my coaching my retreats uh, my events this is all that I do so it's it's a very uncomfortable situation I've worked since I was 14 years old so talk about you know and it's funny because the medicine told me this too because I asked I was so afraid I was like well what am I going to do you know I have a 12 year old and I have a son in college and you know I have bills and And I was like, well, do you have, because I think about Steve Jobs and they said that Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone or the iPod in an ayahuasca, in an ayahuasca ceremony. So I was like, do you have anything I could do? Like, like, give me the next iPod so that I can be good and I can still do my work. Um, And uh, she goes to me, she's like, you're always going to be taken care of. She's like, you don't have to worry about where it's coming from. It's always going to be there. And so I was like, okay, I'm really trusting that. I really, I really do believe that though. Um, the universe I'm a living proof. Yeah, I'm a living proof. You see, it's 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 possible, and you know, and it's beautiful to see people like you saying, like, I didn't know what to do, what I was gonna do, I was gonna be homeless, and all that stuff. Like, I, it's beautiful to see that because it's we have to take chances. We're so stuck thinking that we have to live in this little box of of misery. You know, and you don't understand how many people, when I left my job, there were about six other teachers that wanted to leave, you know, but they were so afraid and they were just like, how are you doing it? I'm like, I'm going to do it. I can't do this anymore. No, your soul is slowly dying. It's, it's totally, it's totally one of us. Uh, you're not here that served you, but no, no more. So now no more. you have to go to the next level. Exactly. And comfort zone is the dead zone. Oh, And I learned one more thing when I was studying NLP in subconscious mind, breakdown happens before breakthrough. This is a scientific explanation on why we go through massive breakdown before we go to the next level. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, and, and there is, you start to realize that you can't, you can't live that way anymore. You start to realize that the discomfort becomes so uncomfortable. There's a, there's a quote, uh, I think Oprah says it. She's like, you know, first the universe whispers at you and tells you, get out of there. This isn't where you're supposed to be. And then it talks a little louder and it says, hey, get out of there. And then it fucking yells. It's like, yo, this isn't your calling, move. And that's where I was like teaching. I was just like, it was such a discomfort. I was miserable. I, I was angry. I was, and it wasn't with the children because I, I absolutely love the children. That's that's one thing I do miss. I miss my babies, but it was with the system. 
I couldn't do this to these kids anymore. I was, it was just the way, the way they treated the children, like little robots, the way we were supposed to like put them all in this little box where they were such beautiful little reflections of God. And all of them were so individual. And yet they were so alike, but I had to put them each in this little box and make sure that they fit into this box because if they yeah. didn't fit in this box, the test scores wouldn't be right. And if the test scores didn't, weren't right, my bosses wouldn't get a raise. And, you know, it was just like this horrible, horrible place. And I was just like, I can't. And by the end, I was telling people off, like about the unfairness that is happening. And, you know, and it was just such an ugly place for me. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore. So if and you actually stayed, you would have get fired anyways. I probably would have. Yeah. <laughs> I think my boss was a that little That universe will be like, get the heck out of here. <laughs> if you don't want to leave, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you move. Exactly. Yeah. No, literally my boss, when I gave her my resignation, she's like, I knew this was coming. Yeah. <laughs> she wasn't, yeah. she wasn't surprised at all. She was like, I knew this was coming. Because you um, started to burn your own, the, the wire that you were sitting on already is like cutting off, cutting off. It was cutting just, off. it was just torturous, but you know, she still, she still loves me. She tried to get me like other yeah. stuff. She tried to keep me, but it was just, it was just, I, I, I loved, I loved the kids. I loved working with the kids. You know, that's one thing I'm trying to figure out that as well. Like, how can I incorporate children into what I do? Um, and I'm you know what we can do, Melissa? We can actually help parents because education starts at home. So exactly. my goal is to actually host the um, retreat for single parents mostly because, um, you know, I am one. And yeah, we need help. Exactly. And now I learned to ask for help, actually, before I never did. It was, I was like, shameful or i was trying to prove a point i can do this by myself you know no. and um what, after having a community and after actually asking for help and receiving it it was a culture shock for me what do you mean like what exactly you, you would do that for me and like what is this with women that we feel guilty when we don't work we feel guilty when we get help it's like how much suppression we can yeah under. it's the, it's the i'll tell you exactly what it is it's the deep rooted unworthiness yeah it's it's so deep it's so deep that we think that it makes us more powerful we 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 convince ourselves that it's, it's it's us being powerful but a lot of the times it's us saying i'm not worthy of somebody well, i changed all that i literally yeah. i have a whole new brain because i've been through my nlp training and now i'm that's exactly what i'm doing so yeah. tell me if someone wants to work with you, how can do the, how can they do that? So you'll give me all your website and yes. Do they need to book single sessions or do you do a group coaching? Tell us about your services. How? So yeah. So I I do one on one and I do group. I'm actually about to launch a group program for starting either in October or November. I haven't gotten a date yet. Uh, mostly for women that want to work one-on-one -on -one with me, but don't feel like it's in their budget. So I'll do a small group so that they're able to still get kind of that one-on-one -on -one attention, but you know, in a, in a small group. And sometimes the container is beautiful when you work in a small group. So, so how long is the coaching? Do you have like a six week commitment? What's the commitment for your coaching? Session? So for, for my coaching um, with my clients now, if you do one-on-one, -on -one, you get eight weeks, you get eight sessions. The, I don't like to say weeks just because we could start weekly and then halfway through, if you're doing great, my goal always is with my clients is that they go out on their own. Like I like to give them the tools so that they don't need me forever. And I always tell that to my clients when I start working with them, like, you're not going to stay with me forever. You're not a lifer. You know, you might come back to me later on, but I want to, I want to get you on your feet. I want to give you these tools. I want you to get rid of all that shit so that you can walk on your own. And maybe you might need me for maintenance or maybe later on in life something will happen you have children or you get married or whatever you're just like oh or you start a new business and you need more and so then you work with me again but right now you get eight sessions with me um and I also incorporate Reiki into my sessions because as you know I'm a Reiki master I'm also a Reiki teacher um so I also teach Reiki um but yeah so you get like two Reiki sessions and you get eight one-on-one -on -one sessions with me uh and that's with my one-on-one -on -one clients and then the group the group um the group program, I'm going to do six weeks and that's going to be literally six weeks. And we're going to go through all six pillars as a small group. Uh, that I with my clients. Yeah. 
you will give me all the information. I will put it under the description. Yes. So this will be video on YouTube and I will post the um, podcast link under the description on this video here. So if you're driving, do not watch the video. Yeah. <laughs> hey. It's really easy. Um, like she said, my my name is The Spiritual Misfit. So my website is thespiritualmisfit.love. And you can schedule your discovery call so that we can work together. And I also have a program for moms. Maybe. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how to love yourself unapologetically when you're a mom. Because that's another thing. We forget who we are when we become moms. And all of a sudden, our life revolves around this beautiful little being. And our identity just becomes mom. Even yep. your kids, like your, my son's kids, they don't know me as Melissa. It's, it's Oliver's mom. Hey, Oliver's mom, Oliver's mom. And it's like, all right, I have my own identity, but it's so it's, an, it's, 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 it's a beautiful, sh- um, what is it called? It's a beautiful, um, I, I, it, it, it shows you exactly what it is, what happens when you have children. It's like you, you lose your identity. A lot of us get married and lose our identity. So it's a lot of work. And I love that what you said, having a retreat for single moms. I think I would definitely love to work with you on that because, one. Because um, I believe education starts at home and we are, the, we are right now programming our children. Yes. The way we act, the way we speak, the way we eat, the way we work out. I mean, they're watching us. And it's beautiful. And it's, 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 it's funny because, you know, everyone's like, do as I say, not as I do, but children don't do what you say. They do what you do. And so every day living life in intention or every day, whatever it is that you're doing, doesn't matter what you're saying, your children are watching what you're doing. And so if you're not living your life in alignment, or you're not learning to love yourself or going through the process of figuring out how to love yourself, your children, you're just going to pass that down to your children. Because we were actually like, I was living my mom's life until I figured it out. I was like, no, 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 I'm going to take charge and I'm going to change this. And thank you, Yahe. Exactly. That was the start. And if it wasn't for what you're doing, maybe you would have repeat your mom's life. Well, and I started, I started to, my son's dad, the one that I told you, uh, his father, his father was a drug yeah. dealer. That's why my mom ended up in prison because she was de- dating a drug dealer and she got yeah. caught with two kilos of cocaine. Oh so yeah, I was literally repeating her life, like literally. <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and now it- there is help. Now there is help. I believe the whole world shifted when we entered the Aquarian age. Now masses are waking up. I think COVID was great. I know it maybe not was great for many people. Many people lost their lives, lost their jobs, lost everything. But it made us realize that we are in charge and we can take over and we can decide. At least for me, I was like so in panic when it started. (gasps) What am I going to do now? And then I had book came out of it and I was taking care of myself. And I think the last two years accelerated my journey with my healing. And now if you notice on social media or even health industry, people are more going into inward and more holistic ways of living and healing and no longer needing every pill that I can pop in so I can feel better okay let me go and see what's going on because now there's a lot of us out there sharing what we're doing yes and it's the ripple effect yes you know this 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 journey and this path is beautiful and the reason one of one of my reasons for going so deep in this path is because in the beginning I had a teacher that told me you know you heal you and you heal everyone that you love in the process because it's like dropping a pebble in a still ocean and it just ripples ripples out and ripples out and when you met me I was at Finca with my mom did you see that and my mom was against everything I believed for a long time and then one day she's like I want to go do that thing you go do and she ended up coming to drink ayahuasca with me in Colombia and so like I really truly believe that we it all starts here and the minute and and no matter what we do but if we're right with us it just ripples out no matter what you do like you could try to fix your sister you could try to fix your brother you could try to fix your mom you could try to fix your dad that's not gonna work fix you and then they see because everyone you meet is you exactly 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 
they're all reflections. And not only that, they see how you live your life and they start seeing like, oh shit, Melissa was that crazy drunk girl that would fall over and cause a scene at every party that she went to. And now look at her. She still has fun though. She looks like she's really enjoying her life though. Maybe and people are like, your meds. <laughs> exactly. exactly. She changed her meds. Exactly. exactly. And, and people are like, wait, what are you doing? You don't understand how often people reach out to me. Like, I see what you're doing. I know who you were. And I see this person that you are. What, how did this happen? And so pe- it, it inspires people because yeah. people are like, shit, like that was the drunk girl that made a scene. Like, oh my God, if I tell you some of my drunk stories, you would die laughing. But that was the drunk girl that caused this scene everywhere she went. And here she is speaking to me. And I want to listen too. It's crazy. And so it's that, it's that example of, like you said earlier, if I did it, you could do it too. Yeah. You know, and we have, and, and, and single moms everywhere. I mean, there are so many of us and we do have to stick together. And, you know, we, me and Juliet have somewhat figured it out. I'm never going to say I figured it out. Somewhat figured it out. Um, well, we cracked the code. Now I'm, I'm uh, mastering it. Exactly. Exactly. So I, yeah. We master and we're going to start mentoring. Exactly. You know, and it's, baby and steps. it's, yeah. And this is a, this is the lifetime journey. Like I'll, I always tell my clients too, like I haven't mastered everything. I haven't, I could tell you, this is a tool for this. And I'll tell you, I'll promise you right now that I haven't mastered it, but you know why I tell you that this is the tool because when I use it, it works. Yes. I might not use it consistently. I might not meditate every day, but when I meditate, it works, right? I might not be in awareness at all times of my life, but when I'm in awareness, it works. So I know that this works. Because when I do do it, it works. Now I'm telling you to try it. Try to do it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. So great to have you here. Thank you so much. We have to have our TV show and have a conversation. Like we should pick a topic and literally get together and talk. This was so much fun. <laughs> I know. I love talking. <laughs> I know. And your happy hands. Hello. Yeah, yeah, my hands, my hands are always moving. They don't stop. I'm in love with me too, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for coming. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. Here's Melissa Romero for you. I will post everything about her on the descriptions and you can connect with her. You can go to her retreats and get happy with her. Yes. Yay. Yeah, thank you so much. Fun. Bye. <laughs> thank you.